Brian Barnett is just a regular guy. He's not a doctor. He has no legal license in any field of mental or emotional health. Brian Barnett merely shares the insights he's gained from his personal experiences for anybody who may choose to use such information as he or she personally chooses, while accepting full responsibility for his or her own individual thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and actions. Brian Barnett assumes no responsibility whatsoever for anybody's individual choice to expose himself or herself to any information that Brian Barnett shares. And by listening to this program, you're acknowledging that you, and only you, are responsible for your own thoughts, feelings, and actions. Happy Thursday, everybody. Welcome back to The Last Symptom. I'm Brian Barnett, the creator and host of The Last Symptom. If you're joining me for the first time, let me welcome you and uh, tell you that I'm somebody who once had borderline personality disorder for the first 35 years of my life. I didn't even know I had it. Then after a major crisis, I was forced to acknowledge that I had it. (laughs) And uh, because that experience was so painful and my losses were so great, there was not a lot of options except for me to become an authority on borderline personality disorder to understand it inside and out in the interest of ridding myself of it. You see, I, I never wanted to experience that sort of pain again. And I was successful doing that. It took me about seven years, but here I am, and I try to use the experience to shorten the recovery time of other people, help you avoid misinformation and the misdirection that exists out there. Last week, I told you a, a story about my near-death experience with Smoke and Joe Frazier in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. This week's campfire story, which I'll save for the end of the show, I'm going to tell you about my cousin Jeremy and a rope swing we tied up near a road one time. I had forgotten about this, and then a buddy of mine recently reminded me of it. It's a funny story. The topics we're going to discuss today about emotional Unhealth and authentic recovery from emotional disorder is, number one, why do I always feel personally attacked? Number two, we'll talk about gray days and thinking. Number three, we'll talk more about thoughts, but we'll talk about them in comparison to feelings so we can understand the distinction between the nature of these two things. Before we get into the, today's discussion, Let's uh, let me tell you about thelastsymptom.com. That's my website full of free resources, and I'm excited to tell you that uh, thelastsymptom.com has gotten some pretty heavy upgrades here recently. So if it's been a while since you've been to the, thelastsymptom.com, I uh, invite you to run over there and just kind of check out the changes and tell me what you think. I have added a brand new page to thelastsymptom.com it's called free resources and it's there that I'm going to put links to all of the free resources that I currently offer this uh, podcast for example is one of those free resources now right now there's four things there they're important four things and a person might look at that page and go wow only four things Well, you have to understand, (laughs) these four things are ongoing and comprehensive and full-bodied. You know, for example, this uh, podcast, uh, I work on it for hours every week. And what, we're now uh, more than halfway through the third season. So there's a, a huge library of information just in that one resource. Another thing is the daily orange slices. If you haven't heard about them, these are condensed video insights that I'm doing daily that are about three to eight minutes in length so they're easily digestible just something to think about during the day which can aid you in your authentic recovery efforts or um, your self-improvement efforts or in your efforts to understand somebody that you care about who's dealing with some sort of emotional disorder they're free but I do them every single day 
and we're nearing the 80th one now so marching right along the only way you can access those by the way is on the last symptom dot locals dot com platform so it's the last symptom community on the locals platform easiest way to get there is just to go to the last symptom dot locals dot com or you can download the locals app and search the last symptom but you don't even have to do that at all if you just run over to the last symptom dot com and go into that new tab i just told you about that new section of the site called free resources i'll be adding things there but um it's exciting for me i'm i'm hoping that it benefits a lot of people of course uh there's a donation arrangement there if you'd like to support my work uh, i highly value that it's very important to what i do and i appreciate it uh, one of the paid resources that i have there in addition to one-on-one -on -one phone calls with me one-on-one -on -one zoom calls with me is the last symptom fundamentals course it's a two-week course it's an intensive course it's comprehensive uh, it goes in and explains everything in a very structured way about how you ended up with an emotional disorder how how that ex actually got there what is it how do you rid yourself of it for real so it's much superior to programs like dbt which focus primarily on symptoms and on you know little bags of tricks of getting you through stressful moments or whatever now this the last symptom fundamentals course goes right to the root causes of these things explains them thoroughly so that you understand them thoroughly you understand all the subtleties that are involved and how to rid yourself of them so if that's something you're interested in be sure to run over to thelastsymptom.com in the paid services section of the site question I'm currently trying to wrap my head around and understand why I have this pattern of being so personally offended if during an argument someone questions my beliefs thoughts or ideas I feel so attacked and insulted is this also based on some erroneous perception the answer is yes it is based on an incorrect perception you see people who live with an emotional disorder any emotional disorder live with two underlying erroneous perceptions and here are the two underlying erroneous perceptions number one my feelings are devoid of inherent worth now we won't go into it here today but when a person believes that their feelings do not possess inherent value what this means is that absent any external source of authority giving it value on it just on its own it's completely valueless completely worthless so really what the person is believing is that their feelings are inherently irrelevant and shameful devoid of inherent worth you see if if you don't perceive that your feelings have inherent value then you're perceiving the inherent nature of them just on their own as being devoid of inherent worth inherently irrelevant shameful so that's the first belief and the second one is if these things are true for my feelings then they're true for me too so anybody walking around with these two distorted underlying perceptions about themselves and about their feelings and about life they go about in life drawing confirmations for these two beliefs in every negative experience in other words every slightly negative experience is perceived by the person carrying those erroneous foundation perceptions as a personal affront you see as confirmation of what they already consciously subconsciously or unconsciously believe these perceived confirmations and they're just perceived confirmations and they're not real confirmations are salt in an already open wound so for example um, I've talked about in the past about how road rage uh, I used to drive angry all the time 
everything that other cars on the road did uh, would just infuriate me because I was perceiving it as confirmation that uh, my safety on the road is not even has no value I have no value um, it's like I'm not even there and that's how these people are driving you know when somebody would race by me and cut me off in traffic or something it's, it was just confirmation of something I already believed about myself I'm so I lack so much value so much inherent value I should say uh, that a person doesn't even have to be courteous to me why would they be courteous to a to somebody who is just totally worthless, who has no value, who's value less, you see. So if you can imagine a healthy person walking around and living with the, the two healthy opposite beliefs, opposite to the unhealthy beliefs, those are my feelings inherently have value, they inherently matter, and so do I. I have inherent worth. That person is not walking around just waiting for the notion that he's worthless or or um, irrelevant to be confirmed, is he? No, be, it, that's not even something he suspects or even wonders about. So uh, equally negative things can happen to a person who is healthy and they don't take it as a personal affront. You see, they they see it for what it is. It's just a person being an idiot or a person driving reckless. It's got nothing to do with you. The, whether you were driving right there in that lane or not, they, they were, they were going to drive stupid. So it's got nothing to do with you. It's not a personal affront in any way. So that's it. That's the answer. Uh, that was a, a brief one. Now, I want to talk to you about gray days. You know, gray days are a great excuse to get into a foul mood, aren't they? I mean, they're just kind of designed for it. They're just kind of designed to uh, wallow in sad thoughts, to feel kind of miserable, to think about all the negative things in life. And not too many years ago... I found gray days depressing. But you know, something changed along with my authentic recovery from borderline personality disorder. Now, I'm not saying I never get sad or that uh, a gray day never puts me into a reflective mood or anything like that. But primarily, nowadays, I find gray days to be beautiful. Uh, gray days, gray kind of drizzly days are my idea of the perfect type of day to be out on a long multi-day and night backpacking trip in the wilderness. You know, it's good thinking weather. Here's a very interesting and very powerful tool that you possess in your arsenal of tools, whether you know it or not, uh, that can... Well, perhaps you've just not been making full use of it. But when I say it's powerful, it is powerful. And here's the tool. It's that we not only have control over what we continue thinking about, but just as importantly, we have full control over how we will think about it. In other words, the perspective we choose to view a thing. So, as I said, gray days could easily be used to think sad, negative things, which is not necessarily bad or wrong. But I can also choose to look at that type of day from a totally different perspective, can't I? For example... I personally use days like that to tap into memories of my childhood or uh, backpacking adventures of the past when I was with my brother and other friends and all the added elements of adventure, the rain and dreariness added to the experience. Have you ever tried to f start a fire in the rain? <laughs> it's 
it's doable. I can do it. I do it all the time. But it's a skill that you kind of got to develop. When you're backpacking in the wilderness and all you've got is some shelter, you know, that you got to string up between two trees or something like that, uh, do you know how hard it is to stay dry? Like, how do you get that set up in rain and get in and stay dry and not get the inside of your shelter soaking wet? Or what if you, you're just using a tarp or something and the ground is soaking wet? Now, how do you stay dry? You might stop the rain from falling on top of you, but now how do you stay dry once you get in there? It, that's part of the fun. <laughs> that's part of the fun. Specifically, when I... Uh, when there's gray days and it's drizzly and rainy and it just seems to go on for forever you know day after day I specifically think about a backpacking trip that uh, I was on with my brother and my buddy Jeff and an Israeli guy named Boaz we we encountered him in the woods and he was actually visiting from Israel uh, I believe he had just, or he was, he was being called to obligatory service in the military, but he had some time before he had to go, so he was using that time to backpack a large portion of the Appalachian Trail, and that's where we come across him. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of funny uh, stories about that. <laughs> in fact, this is not in the in my outline today, but I'm going to go ahead and tell it anyway. The we come up on Boaz in a shelter on the first night. We had a fire going. It'd been raining like cats and dogs all day long, and he come up on us and hey, can I can I be around your fire? We said yeah, yeah, come on in. And here I am doing the uh, accents again. You know, you guys know how my success rate with doing accent, accents, but I'm going to give it a whirl anyway. Yeah, yeah, come on in. What's your name? My name's Boaz. Oh, nice to meet you, Boaz. I'm Brian. This is my brother. This is my other friend. And we kind of adopted him into our group. Well, <laughs> like I said, this is not at all in the in my outline. and it's, I'm afraid it's going to turn into kind of a long story, but it's worth telling. So that first night, you, you got to understand, we're in Pennsylvania deep in the woods we've uh, taken this total stranger into our group and uh, as we're bedding all bedding down you know it's gotten very late and we're all bedding down I was just on the verge of knocking out I was just on the verge of sleep when I hear Boaz's voice from from the dark corner of the of the shelter where he was at and he said there do you mind if I ask you a question? And uh, I kind of woke up out of my near sleep, and I thought, oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. What's the question, Boaz? Well, he says, I'm just wondering. Let's say, uh, you know, the United States, it doesn't always make sense to me. Uh, let's say, and I know I realize I'm doing like a cross between an Antonio Banderas and a French guy right now, but it's the best I can do. Let's say, he says, uh, that uh, a person were to commit a murder. You know, just let's just say that somebody was going to commit a murder. If they commit the murder in one of the states that does not have the death penalty, but then uh, would, they, would he risk the death penalty? penalty? I said, no. Uh, no, not not if he committed the crime in a state that does not have the death penalty. All right, good night, Boaz. I start to roll over. He goes, uh, uh, pardon me, just I have a few more questions. Um, let's say that the person commits the murder in a state that does have the death penalty, but then flees to a state that does not have the death penalty. Uh, well, they probably... Once they caught him, they'd probably take him back to the state where the crime occurred for his trial and everything. Oh, okay. Well, good night. I said, all right, good night, Boaz. I mean, I wasn't, I didn't think a thing about it. And I rolled right over and I went right to sleep. Next morning, I get up, I go over to the edge of the woods there. I'm draining the old one-eyed lizard. And my brother comes up to me and he goes, uh, 
while I'm standing there peeing, he says, Hey, how did you sleep last night? And I said, uh, I, I slept pretty good. Why? How did you sleep? He said, I didn't sleep a wink all night. I said, well, you didn't. Why not? He said, are you kidding me? We're all sitting there getting ready to go to sleep next to this total stranger. He starts asking about murders and the death penalty and extradition. and <laughs> He says, <laughs> I pulled out my knife. And he said, I hugged my knife and just sat there in the dark all night long, <laughs> waiting to see <laughs> what this Boaz guy was going to do. Oh, man, it's so funny. And I tell you, I honestly did not think a second thing about it. He's asking me these things. I guess because I, I'm just so tired. But I didn't think a second thing about it. Would you say if, uh, oh, I don't know, you kill somebody and then you go across the state line? And, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, this is probably happening. That probably, well, good night, Boaz. <laughs> I mean, I was out. I was out. Oh, brother. But that, how funny is that? So this trip that I just got done telling you about where we come up on Boaz is one of those experiences that I, I think about on gray, rainy days. Um, you know, at the time it was a little miserable the rain complicated things like fires uh, keeping the fires going uh, also our boat our boots were soaked through and you know we had to hike, hike this way for like at least 10 miles every day which was uncomfortable there, there were a lot of complications like this um, at one point on this trip we were camped in one of the most breathtakingly beautiful isolated spots in the woods uh, at a fork of two rushing creeks we were down in a holler and this creek come through there and split and we were in the middle so it kind of created an island and we were kind of up on that island between these two creeks we had just gushing crystal clear water all night long and the you know the sound of that water all night long along with the rain it was just gorgeous um we were all a little on edge for bears because we were in a high population area for them and we were headed into winter it was right toward the very uh, end of fall or autumn as some of you might call it and uh this is a time when bears are trying to fatten up as much as possible before hibernating so just added to the thrill you know and added to the excitement at one point while we were sitting around the fire where we were camped on the fork of this creek i'll tell you what if i could run out the door and strangle my neighbor dogs i just strangle them until they pass out and they just leave them there passed out in their backyard their owner's backyards i'd do it if i if i thought i could get away with it but you know everybody's got those darn cameras and stuff these days i i don't think i could get away with it so anyway if you if you couldn't hear my neighbor dog barking into the microphone well then that little tirade there probably didn't make a lot of sense but trust me it's he sounds like he's right outside my my window it's not my dog it's the neighbor dog but i think he knows every time i go to record this show and he just he wants you guys to hear him he's got he wants you to hear his beautiful voice i can't really blame him for that so we're camped up on this uh on the fork between this this these two creeks you know where this creek comes to a fork and we're kind of up in the middle there at one point, my brother went off by himself into the deep, dark woods. This is in the middle of the night while we're sitting around the fire, jawing, telling stories and stuff. He went down there to find a private place to take a squat. While knowing that we're in bear season, you know, bears are trying to fatten up and everything. They're all getting ready to hibernate. And he went down into the woods to squat with these thoughts in his head. So myself and the other guys were sitting around the fire in the rain caught up in rich conversation about a myriad of topics and suddenly we heard this tremendous crash down in the deep dark woods 
And what had happened was that an enormous tree branch had let go, torn off away from the tree, and had just went crashing down into the holler. So uh, we all shouted down there at my brother, because we knew my brother was down there. We all shouted down to him, hey, you okay, you okay, trying to guess his whereabouts. And we just heard his voice come up from the dark woods, yeah, yeah, I'm okay. So when he come back moseying to the fire, we asked him how close that enormous branch had fallen in relation to where he had been squatting down there. And uh, he said it was pretty close. Then he told us <laughs> that he had been struggling with some serious constipation for the past few days while we were on this backpacking trip. But because he is so worried about bears while he was down there in the dark alone and squatting, when that tree branch broke loose and crashed down into the woods, this startled him so much that... <laughs> <laughs> that he entirely emptied out his bowels. <laughs> Can you imagine? Can you imagine being in the middle of that act? <laughs> and all of a sudden, some huge tree <laughs> crashing behind you, and you just, in a second, emptying out your bowels. Never have I laughed so hard. So the point is, I, just like many people, could easily get myself down and sad on days that are gray and rainy and, and um, you know, kind of typical of, like, uh, of sadness, typical of sadness. But because I know that I have full control over how I choose to think about things, you know, this is a superpower that I... I use frequently in my life because I know I have this superpower I usually choose to exercise this power by thinking about gray days from a positive perspective I remember the beauty I witnessed on days like that and the great experiences that I've had you know I haven't even told you about fishing I have so many memories of days like that when I was a kid growing up um, I would have it in my heart to get some good fishing in the next day. I always love fishing because it's a it's a great excuse for solitude and thought. You know, you can get off by yourself and just get lost in thought, kind of enjoy your surroundings and peace and stuff like that. And so there was a pond, oh, about two miles back from in the woods, in our woods, and. Uh, and I would make plans the night before, and then I'd get up at like 5 o'clock in the morning. The sun wouldn't even be up. I'd grab my fishing pole, and I'd go trudging back through the woods and take me a while to get back here. And, you know, I was hoped for a beautiful sunny day, but some of the best experiences I had out there, fishing and skipping rocks and stuff, were not on sunny, beautiful days. They were on drizzly, miserable kind of days that most people wouldn't want to be out there in. But anyway, I, I choose to think about the beauty that I've witnessed on days like that, these great experiences. And I know, well, I hope there will be many more. In the last symptom group on the Locals community, L-O-C-A-L-S, I will post some pictures from the PA 309 to Port Clinton trip I mentioned in this story. So rainy and miserable in many ways, but the rain made for some absolutely spectacular pictures and memories. So if you're interested in seeing those pictures, please join our group there at thelastsymptom.locals.com and um, I'll, I'll post the best ones there. All right, well, now let's talk about feelings never being good or bad, right or wrong. And in my notes here, these are sort of old notes, but in my notes I've got uh, next to this, the non-thinking religious fanatics obstacle. <laughs> it's a little harsh, 
but that's the notes that I put down. I must have been getting a lot of pushback at the time. I've been asked how we can be responsible for our thoughts, behaviors, and our feelings if feelings are never good or bad, right or wrong. Well, one problem here is that a lot of people like to equate responsible for as meaning the same as guilty for, right? When I, when, when I say you're responsible for a thing, am I saying that you're guilty for having done something bad? No. You know, a, a captain is responsible for a ship. I'm responsible for taking care of my mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual needs. Um, nobody else is responsible for that for me. I'm responsible for that. Now, when I was a child, it was my parents' responsibility. But just saying that a person is responsible for a thing is not uh, the same as saying that they're guilty of something. You see, saying a person is responsible for a thing is not the same as saying that they've committed some kind of crime or that they've done something wrong. Now, people are responsible for their thoughts and actions in one sense and then they're responsible for their feelings in an entirely different sense. Let me explain what I mean. And basically what it all comes down to is thoughts and actions, the nature of what they just are, is totally different than the nature of feelings. And so they can't be held, they can't be categorized in the same way that feelings are, you know, thoughts, actions, feelings. You're responsible for and you have control over your thoughts and your actions. Because you you are responsible for these things and you have control over them, you could be held accountable for them. Because you're responsible for them and you have control over them, they can be classified as something good or bad, right or wrong that a person is doing. Why is that? It's because thinking and actions are something we do. It's, it's an action we are taking. You see, if I'm thinking things, I'm choosing to continue thinking those things. But at any time, I could choose to change what I'm thinking, or as we just discussed, even how I'm thinking about it, and choose to think about something different, or even continue thinking about whatever it is I'm thinking, but choose to think about it in a different way. For example, what if I catch myself having negative stereotypical thoughts about an entire race of people? I don't have to continue thinking that way, do I? You see, I have the capacity to recognize that what I'm thinking is not accurate, it's not right, and I can choose to think about that in a different way. I can choose to think about all the beautiful qualities of that group of people instead. What if I catch myself thinking negative things in general? Not about any particular race of people or anything, but just negative things in general, you know. Let's say I I wake up and and I realize, boy, I'm, I'm just wallowing in a lot of negative thoughts today. Well, I have the power to choose to think more positively don't I? Of course I do. By contrast, you don't have control over feelings. You see, a lot of people have the notion that feeling is something you do. That, that when you feel something, you're actually doing that. You're, you're feeling. But feeling is not something you do. You say, well, if it's not something I'm doing, what is it then? It's something you are experiencing. Think about uh, walking outside and you catch a whiff of some flowers. Hey, what's that smell? Oh, I'm smelling flowers. Is, are you making yourself smell the flowers? No, you're just experiencing the smell of flowers. You didn't set out to do that. You're not even, you don't even really have a choice in the matter except to pinch your nose. It's something you're experiencing. So because feelings are something we experience and not something we're doing, it doesn't fit into the same category as thinking 
or behaving. You can't be held responsible or accountable for things you're simply experiencing, which that's the category feelings fall into. You can't be held responsible or accountable for things you simply feel no more than you can be held accountable for feeling cold outside in the winter time. But you are responsible for your feelings. In what sense? In the sense that they're yours. You, know, you yourself are generating them within yourself. They aren't being generated by some outside person or thing, which is why the whole notion of triggers is total horseshit. But whatever you feel is what you feel. You are generating them within yourself. It's an experience that is being generated within yourself based on your perceptions, your thoughts, uh, memories that you might... uh, be recalling to mind but whatever you feel is what you feel there's nothing good or bad right or wrong about it now every time I have this discussion I get folks who want to argue that one God judges us based on our feelings number two that we can't actually control our thoughts so let's address both and those of you who do not believe in God Uh, I hope you'll tolerate me for a minute while I get into some God talk. It won't be for very long, just brief. But I appreciate your understanding that there are fellow listeners of this program who might need this topic addressed. All right, so I don't want to be insensitive to your personal beliefs or anything. But you got to understand that uh, there are people out there who um, do believe in God. And this is something they need to understand. This is something they're trying to work out. So to start the conversation, you have to understand that a thing can't inherently not be good or bad, right or wrong, and at the very same time be something that God uses to judge you. Do you see how that's a total contradiction? If you believe in God then whatever the true nature of a thing is, you have to understand or you have to accept the fact that this is also the way God sees it. Can we agree on that? Whatever the true nature of a thing is, that's also the way God must see it. So if you establish what the true nature of a thing is, then you're aligning your perceptions with, with God's perceptions. There's no other possibility. In other words, whatever God's perspective on a thing is, this also defines its inherent nature. You see it works in reverse, if, if you believe in God. If you determine what the inherent nature, the, the true nature of a thing is, then that's God's perspective on it. If you flip that around, it works the same way. Whatever God's perspective of a thing is, then that's its inherent nature because he's the one who created it he knows Uh, and besides he's the ultimate authority so when we talk about learning to correctly see the inherent nature of things this is synonymous with aligning our perspectives with God's perspectives on any given thing we're just trying to understand the true nature of things right because if we do with that new accurate understanding of the reality we exist in we can better live within that reality we can make decisions harmonious with that reality so what is God's perspective on feelings well here it is that feelings themselves are never good or bad right or wrong how do we know We know it because nobody has ever been damned or punished for what they feel by God. There's a lot of unhealthy parents who, who do that, but God doesn't. You see, the thoughts or perspectives, perspectives just our thoughts, memories are thoughts, 
you, you know, you, you get what I'm saying. Thoughts covers a wide variety of specifics, but the thoughts behind feelings might be good or bad, right or wrong, accurate or inaccurate. But the resulting feelings themselves cannot be. Uh, how you feel about a thing can't be good or bad, right or wrong. Um, the perspectives that you're using that are uh, generating those, those feelings might be inaccurate. Uh, like the example I used earlier about uh, thinking about a whole race of people in a negative way. Clearly, I'm using an inaccurate perspective to generate then probably racist feelings. That's the only real thing that they can give birth to. But if I correct those perspectives, make some adjustments there, oh, I say, no, wait a second. They don't all do that. Uh, in fact, I know a bunch of people from that race, and they've only treated me like angels. And I start to, to correct my, those, that thinking, and then what happens to my feelings? My feelings adjust accordingly. So think about Cain and Abel. You know the story of Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel were brothers, and Cain was jealous of Abel because Abel had God's approval. Cain did not. And uh, Cain started to entertain some bad thoughts. Now, if you read that account, you'll notice that God spoke to Cain about what Cain was feeling. When, when God spoke to Cain about what he was feeling, did he punish Cain in that moment for what Cain was feeling? No, he didn't. Instead, he encouraged Cain to change his thinking. He didn't say, Cain, feel something different. But he did encourage him to change his thinking. Why do you reckon God did that for? Well, probably because God knows that our feelings are generated by whatever our thoughts and perspectives are. So, he encouraged Cain to change his thinking so as to avoid some sort of terrible outcome. And in fact, I think the Bible, you know, I didn't, I didn't open up the Bible to write this outline. I'm just going by memory. But I think that uh, the wording that the Bible uses is that uh, God warned Cain with these precise words, if you don't, if you don't change your thinking and, and your behaviors, sin is crouching at the door. So when was it that God brought down consequences on Cain? Was it because of what he was feeling? He said, well, Cain, you're, th you're feeling negative things, so I'm going to punish you. No, God didn't do that. It wasn't until Cain acted, acted upon these thoughts and feelings. The first thing he didn't do was he didn't change his thinking. So he continued feeling the way he felt. <laughs> and then he acted. So, Cain was not punished for what he felt. He was punished for not changing his thoughts, which then led to actions that God punished him for. So, if you can't reconcile your belief in God with the idea that feelings are never good or bad, right or wrong, you simply won't progress in authentic recovery from emotional disorder because authentic recovery depends on this healthy adjustment in perception, understanding, and thinking. You see, I'm asking you to do the same thing on this topic that uh, God asked Cain to do. You just change your thinking. Challenge that thinking. Choose to think differently. Remember, feeling is not doing. When you feel something, that's not an example of you having done a thing. So it's worth honestly examining yourself to determine if perhaps you're not modeling your notions of God after the unhealthy authority figures who raised you. Maybe you've arrived at certain conclusions blindly, or you're finding it difficult to give up the false concepts you've been taught your entire life. And, you know, maybe in subtle ways, too. Maybe it's a very subtle adjustment you have to make. And uh, maybe a lot of things you were taught were 
from people who see things through unhealthy filters and misconceptions, you see, and then they use these unhealthy filters and misperceptions and misconceptions to reach the conclusions that they do. But feelings are never good or bad, right or wrong, and they're not something you do that can be held against you or used as the basis for some sort of judgment. Authentic recovery from emotional disorder, this is a pillar of that. It, you, a person must come to understand that point and accept it. Now about thoughts. If I see a billboard on the side of the road of a girl in her panties, you've heard me talk about this before, I might immediately have sexual thoughts that pop into my head that I have no control over. Or a person might say to me, hey Brian, don't think about purple elephants. Well, of course, the first thing that's going to come into my, my mind are purple elephants. So some disingenuous people want to focus on this aspect of thinking and say, see there, we can't control what we think. But I've never said that we can control what we think. I've said we can control our thoughts and we can control what we continue thinking about. But I've never said we can just control every single thought that, that pops into our head. You see, it pops in there. We don't have to continue thinking that. We can push it aside and choose to think about something else. Or we can choose to think about it in a different way. But, you know, even so, being able to control what we continue thinking about effectively means that we have total control over our thoughts, even if some thoughts pop into our brains unwelcome. Do you know what this means in practical terms that we can control what we continue thinking about? It means that if some thought pops into your head, out of your control, the fact that this can happen is utterly irrelevant. <laughs> because if we can control what we choose to continue thinking about, then isn't it completely and totally irrelevant that I have an uninvited thought of, let's say, murdering my neighbor? Yes. The fact that a thought like that popped into my head against my will is utterly irrelevant as long as I can recognize the thought and reject it and choose to think about something else that means that the fact that such a thought occurred at all is irrelevant the only thing that matters is did I choose to continue entertaining those thoughts or not so in every practical sense that actually matters we have total control over our thoughts now, the exception to this is when people are dealing with mental illness Borderline personality disorder is not a mental illness. Mental illness is when one's brain is malfunction, malfunctioning. And borderline personality disorder is an em emotional disorder, not a mental illness. Those who have borderline personality disorder only and strictly, who are not also living with additional issues such as mental illness, these people are not dealing with a malfunctioning brain. Their brains are working precisely as they're supposed to. So, anybody focusing on the fact that some random thoughts pop into our heads without our choice, while ignoring the much more relevant point that we all have the ability to, to reject such thoughts and that we have total power to redirect our thoughts anywhere else that we choose, those people don't want to get better. You, you, they want to argue in defense of not getting better. So, it's something to self-analysis that people can make. Well, that's the show for today. I promised you a, a campfire story, even though I feel like I've told bunches of stories throughout this show. The rope swing by the road. When I went out to uh, on this most recent backpacking trip with my friend Brian Lambert, we're sitting around a fire. He said, "Brian, do you remember that time I was over at your house?" He used to, he just lived a couple miles up the road from me. And uh, when he was 10, 11, something like that, uh, his parents would just loan him the car. <laughs> He'd drive down to my house at like 10, 11 years old. And then we'd go fishing, we'd play in the woods, stuff like that. But he said, do you remember I was at your house that time? And we'd tied up a rope swing down by the road. Now, way down uh, at the end of our yard was a gravel road, a dirt road and a tree, there were lots of trees there but 
had uh, one tree in particular had a branch that went out over the road and we had tied a rope on there and uh, me and my cousins and my brother we would climb up that tree and get on that rope and we would swing right out clear across the road to the other side of the road and back now I had totally forgotten that this happened but it happened uh, my cousin Jeremy got up there and was getting ready to swing one time and we heard a car <laughs> we heard a car coming down the road down that gravel um, anybody who's ever grown up on a gravel road you know what I'm talking about you it's got a very distinct sound the sound of wheels on the gravel road but we heard that car coming and we started screaming no don't do it don't do it and uh, he swung out there anyway swung out swung back tried to get his feet up on the tree couldn't so he went for another swing and at this point this truck come right up over the hill and Jeremy went swinging back out across the road and that truck was like to hit him uh, like a like a bug on his windshield but Jeremy the timing of it was just perfect and Jeremy went running <laughs> <laughs> he had his legs moving and he ran right across that guy's moving windshield and did not get hurt um, of course the guy stopped and he chewed us out man and we must have given him a heart attack Jeremy must have given him a heart attack can you imagine that just driving down the road and all of a sudden some 10 <laughs> year old <laughs> comes running across your windshield oh gosh it's a wonder any of us ever survived to adulthood well that's my story folks i hope you're having a wonderful week i hope you have an even better weekend you know the rule you got to do something nice for yourself because that's what we do for people that we genuinely care about and uh, i don't know about you but i i genuinely care about myself i want to do something nice for myself I, I i like me i hope you feel that way about yourself too I'll see you next year, uh, next week, same place, same time, right here on the Last Symptom Show. And uh, you folks take care of yourselves, all right? Mm-hmm.